Welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm John Lin, together with my colleague and friend, Colin Hun. The world of technology and healthcare are ever-changing in new and novel ways, and that's why we love this stuff. So join us as we discuss the latest healthcare and health IT news meshed together in new ways which help generate ideas and new perspectives. Plus, we'll have a little fun along the way. Today, we're going to be discussing whether penalties work to motivate in healthcare. And be sure to follow the show on social media at the hashtag HITSM and our personal accounts at TechGuy and at Colin underscore Hung. Plus, check out our 18 years of health IT blog content at healthcareittoday.com. You know, penalties are interesting. I have uh, some bills outstanding that I just haven't got to, but I'm like, I know the penalty's small. <laughs> it's interesting. It's all throughout our life. <laughs> it is. It is so true. But of course, that side of penalties works pretty well on the healthcare billing side. Right? <laughs> but, but that's not what we're here to talk about, because that is something we're used to in other areas of our life, for sure. And yeah, like you, John, I'm like, the penalties are like, it's, I'm not a big, it's not a big deal, like a dollar or something. But then when it gets to double digits, I'm like, oh boy, I gotta, this I gotta fix this. <laughs> it's true. I'm not paying interest. I'm not paying late fees and you better credit it back to me. I'm going to get angry about that just out of personal spite, probably <laughs> as much as the cost itself. But yeah, you're right. When it hits that double digits personally, it's like, it's a motivator. But I, I think that's the interesting thing when you look at healthcare. And I think it's even more apparent with healthcare because healthcare can just pass on the cost to patients in, in a lot of ways. Sure, there is some standardized reimbursement, but in the long run, they'll just keep in re increasing reimbursement to some degree, you know, to, to deal with it, or they stop doing certain procedures. So I think they're actually a little less, I would say healthcare is less penalty sensitive than maybe some other businesses where the models are different. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, well, I I think it depends on, like, there's so many areas of penalties, right? I think we talked about it just now. You know, I think on the personal level, penalties work to motivate people who just have forgotten or didn't realize, and we're going to pay anyway, but just need that little extra bit of motivation. I think penalties work on, like they do in other industries. I don't think that's any different. But, you know, when we're talking about penalties to motivate a certain behavior by an organization, uh, whether that's like privacy, security, again, all those kinds of things. Uh, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure we uh, like, meaning I'm not sure they work. And so I agree with you that maybe we are a, penal a little bit penalty ins insensitive here in healthcare. Because, um, yeah, I mean, just judging by what's happening, uh, you know, it's not like a lot of we have a sea change of behavior difference when it comes to certain aspects where there are some penalties, right? <laughs> I think the other challenge with penalties is structuring them appropriately and being able to enforce them. I think that, you know, the former is tough because you want to penalize those who really deserve the penalties and not those that are, you know, trying to do what's right and screwing up. And that that's sometimes challenging, right, to differentiate the two. And so, you know, we often put penalties out there and we either do it not hard enough because we don't want to damage someone that shouldn't be penalized inappropriately, or we do it too hard and then we're penalizing someone inappropriately and then they get mad and then you have to reel it back anyways. Right. And so I think that's where penalties is hard is how do you moderate them? So it's hitting the right people. And then on the government side of things, I mean, when I talk to my friends that have worked at OCR and in the government, they don't have enough resources to enforce the penalties. So like, okay, you can have penalties, but if you don't have, funding for enforcement of the penalties do the penalties really exist not really so then they like pick and choose and they try to use a big name to try to motivate action using the penalty you know to a big name with a big violation or a breach or whatever it is that's happened you know as a way to try to scare everyone that that penalty could be you which is effective to a certain degree but not fully no, you're right. I mean, the enforcement is always the, the Achilles heel of penalties, right? You have to be willing to enforce it and collect those penalties in order for it to have any sort of motivational behavior change. Um, I do think, though, one aspect that maybe we don't talk enough about, about the aspect of penalties, is the internal awareness that penalties can help drive. Like you may not be, you may not be feel that there's a high degree of likelihood of, you know, somebody collecting that penalty. But if I was motivated to 
change, let's say my cybersecurity practices, maybe I was uh, motivated to change my patient experience, right? Because there's penalties for those kinds of things. Uh, I could use the excuse that there is a penalty out there to maybe bring this and put this on the table where it would might get a little bit more of attention now, right? Because this penalty is out there. So that's a little hidden thing because we don't know if that's happening like internally at an organization, but I would definitely use the penalty as a way to lever my way to make sure I get some more budget into those areas. So even though it might not motivate ultimately the, the a, a ground uh, breaking change in behavior, it might make some difference for me to get that little extra bit of budget, get that one project approved internally at like an organization. Yeah, I wonder how many people that are creating these penalties think, oh, this is another feather in the cap of the person, or at least some ammo for the person who's trying to get an initiative done and can't get buy-in for it. They can use the penalties as buy-in, I think, which is what you're saying. I think that's that's really interesting. I think it's also interesting to look at penalties and incentives or carrots and sticks, as we like to call them, you know, like which is more more motivating, you know, penalty versus incentive. And I think, you know, when you look at meaningful use, the incentive is what everyone was going after. And I didn't hear anyone complain about the penalty. In fact, those that did decided not to go after the incentive were like, yeah, that's a rounding error for me. I don't really care. You know, like the penalty didn't matter to them. Uh, in fact, it almost harmed because the penalty was on Medicare in that case. And so they ended up saying, well, fine, we'll just stop taking Medicare. They're the worst payer out there. So, you know, it's like you have to have the right penalty or it definitely is not going to make an impact. So so on that note, John, is there an incentive or penalty in healthcare that you think has worked really well? I mean, the 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 shining star for me is hospital readmissions. And there's certainly some nuance to it. Like, has it incentivized or penalized the the right thing? I don't know. You know, that could be a, a larger discussion. But I'll tell you, every single health system out there in hospital knows that number and they know how it impacts them financially, whether they're either taking it on the chin because they haven't reduced it or whether they've reduced it and kind of got the incentive that's associated with that. So, and I don't know if that's considered an incentive or a penalty, but yeah, I mean, hospital readmissions to me is the one that is the shining star of like, man, this changed a lot of behavior versus what we did before. No, you're you're at right. That that would be my example as well. Is that one penalty uh, or incentive? The way you look at it, it's more of I, I look at it more as a penalty. I think people think of it more as a penalty. Uh, I think has motivated the right behavior and given the excuse for organizations to finally fund things that they kind of were funding before, but now are really putting a, a big focus on it, right? Because I don't think anybody wants this. It was one of those things where no one wanted this to happen, but now there's like, okay, now there's even more reason. This is now the justification for spending a million, two million, three million dollars on these types of programs. Whereas before it was a struggle because it was a hidden metric. Not a lot of people maybe were tracking it. So, so the fact that this penalty exists to, to the point we were just talking about, I think motivated a lot of people to go, okay, you know what, let's, let's, you know, we haven't been penalized. We don't probably don't have a big of a problem, or maybe I think I don't have a big of enough problem, but the fact that this penalty is now there, let's do something about it. Let's invest in this area. So definitely a, a good one. The other one for me though, is the wall of shame, <laughs> right? The, the breach hall of shame. Of <laughs> exactly. It's a different kind of penalty. It's not a monetary one. But just the fact that, you know, you're up on that website and, you know, all, for all your peers to see that, you know, you had a breach and you had to report it and the number of records and so forth. Now, unfortunately, there have been so many that that wall is maybe losing its, you know, uh, its effectiveness. But it was still a great motivator in, in the sense of it put a spotlight on this problem. Right. And, and collectively, I think the industry is now aware of this problem and trying to do something about it to the point where now they're trying to lobby the government to give them money to do it. But but at least it highlighted this problem because otherwise it would happen and there would be no, like, you know, it, it would be up to the media to report these things, right? So I think that's an example of where a non-financial penalty has worked. Well, I, I would give the HIPAA breach, HHS wall of shame. I think we should make that the official name too, by the way. But, uh, you know, like I, I think those, I would give it a 50% success rate. Like, okay. you know, it certainly has motivated half of the organizations that don't want to be on the wall of shame, don't want the fines. I think half of them have just been like, that's fine. It's okay. You know, like, what am I supposed to do? I'm doing the best I can, right? So it hasn't really motivated a bunch of them. And I think the other thing that is interesting about that is there's so many other, not 
penalties, but like damages that occur when a breach happens that are actually even more significant than any penalty that OCR would put out or even the damage of the wall of shame. You know, your local media reporting on you being down because you had a breach, that's actually more damaging than the wall of shame, probably. You know, your organization being down for two weeks and patients coming in and sadly, in some cases, even dying, right? Like that is more damaging to your reputation and to even the business workflow of two weeks of no electronic record or whatever it is that goes down. Like, those are more damaging than anything that the you know government organizations uh, could penalize. So that's why I guess I can't give full credit to the government because there's so many other things that are motivating organizations to change. As I expand further, though, like one that hasn't worked is uh, with price transparency. The, the penalties there have not been significant enough to really move people. And many are just like, whatever, I, I don't care, you know, give us the penalty, bring them on, right? And it feels like that's that's how their attitude is anyways. Um, you know, I, I, there's one I'm watching and I, I'm, I'm kind of on that probably it's not gonna make an impact, but I'm interested to see. And that is the information blocking disincentives that were just recently approved and everything. There are some significant penalties depending on your organization and which value-based programs you're working on in MIPS, et cetera. Um, but you know, they definitely tried to put teeth into it. Now I'm interested to see how are people going to reply and how is it going to be enforced and you know, all of those things. So I, I don't think it's going to have a huge difference. In fact, the biggest difference might be what you said before. Someone saying we can't information block because we don't want to be on that. And they have their own wall of shame for information blocking too, or uh, I forget what they call it. It's a different name as well. But, you know, like, so and that one, I'm like, that one, it's TBD for me. No, it's, those are those are good one. I was going to say information blocking is going to be an interesting one to watch for sure to see whether those disincentives are true or whether they're, as you put it, they're simply just a cost of doing business, right? Like people just work it into the cost. Um I certainly hope that's not the case, but you, you just never know uh, when you implement a disincentive. And also it's unclear uh, who's and how they're going to enforce it, right? Mm -hmm. I think out of the gate, there'll be some examples made, but then whether or not it actually can be fully applied, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting how, I, I think the problem with many of these models is they don't understand how the business of healthcare works. And so the incentives aren't aligned in a, in a way that makes sense and actually creates the action that they want. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how it, it all plays out, but information blocking is going to be one to definitely watch and see what happens there. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Healthcare IT Today with John Lin and Colin Hung. Today, we're discussing penalties and disincentives in healthcare and whether or not they work to achieve the desired goals. So, so John, let me ask you this question. Do you think that financial penalties are the most effective form of penalties for healthcare? I mean, I always say follow the money. So I feel like the answer has to be yes, <laughs> to some degree. But I, I mean, to your point that you kind of made earlier, the shame is a type of financial penalty. Because even if you shame someone or an organization, I don't want to shame people with that, you know, that's a topic for another day. But, you know, they, we, you know if, you, if an organization gets their reputation hurt, that does end up becoming a financial penalty as well. So I, I think there's something to say about that. The other one that I think is important to think about in this regard is not every motivation should be financial. Because if it is, then we're going to have a terrible health system. And, and now you need to keep it in mind. And I think it's really, obviously, I, I let off with saying yes. So the financial stuff matters. But there are humans involved, both on the provider side and the patient side. And, you know, the, the, the incentive or penalty shouldn't just be financial. Because there, in healthcare, there are emotional penalties. What's the impact on a doctor if they do that, right? I mean, if I'm a doctor and my system goes down for two weeks and I can't practice medicine the way that I need to, that's incredibly damaging to me and my experience. And so, you know, I, and maybe we don't tell those stories enough to be able to make that an incentive 
or a penalty for you know being breached. So, uh, you know, I think there are those things, but maybe they're just harder to enforce and harder to communicate. Yeah, you know, well, I'm gonna say I actually think that at an individual level, um, incentives and penalties are not super effective. Right, like we've seen a lot of payers, uh, for example, try to gamify behavior change in people's health, right, by giving you discounts or offering you money actually to quit smoking and doing these things, and to some degree it works, but for the majority of people, it's not motivating enough. Problem is, you have to, you know, but you have to make that those incentives to your point big enough, and then you're in this sort of never-ending game of you always have to up it, right? Well, you know. You know, it was a thousand dollars last year. It should be like twelve hundred this year because of inflation. Like you just you're in an endless game, and so I can understand why it's not a great hamster wheel to get on. But at an individual level, I'm not sure that financial incentives work. And to your point, there's a lot of other motivations that levers that I could pull for an individual. But I have to say, for an organization, an organization is sort of like an impersonal entity, and for those, I think you have to hit them in the pocketbook. Otherwise, no one's going to listen. But it has to be significant. Otherwise, as we've seen, it's not, it's a it's a rounding error for some organizations. Right. We saw what happens when you offer billions of dollars to digitize healthcare. All of a sudden everyone jumped on board, right? You know, we, we're starting to see some of the incentives and other ways uh work maybe in the info info blocking area because the penalties are fairly significant, right? Uh, but I think until it really hits the bottom line, you're not going to get enough attention. There'll always be that one member of the executive team or the board who goes, well. You know, what's our risk here, right? Which is a legitimate question to ask, right? Like if you feel like you're doing a good job, then what is the risk? If the answer is low. Then you're like, that's eh, big deal. Right. Um, so I, I think, think it has that, to be big enough. Yeah. I, I think that's the big problem with this idea of financial penalties. It, it reminds me of my son. My son is very calculated. He's very much tell me the details. Let me make a decision. So if I say, you know, clean your room, He'll say to me, well, what's the penalty, dad? And he literally does a calculation that's like, yeah, I'm probably okay with that penalty. I'd rather do it, right? Like, and, and I think organizations are very much similar. That when you implement a penalty, they're like, yeah, that just becomes a cost of doing business. And if the penalty is not big enough, it doesn't actually motivate any change. It just becomes a cost. You know, so I think that is one of the troubles in and you're, it's interesting, your comment about the individual level versus the organization level. I've talked to some people who worked at payers, incredible people that want to do the best stuff for patients. And I would look at some of the things that payers do, and I'd be like, is this how it is? And they're like, no, we're just so dysfunctional that that's why it's the way it is. You know, if we were more functional, we wouldn't do it that way. And I've said that to a couple of payers recently. And they're all like, yeah, but at the highest level, the, the bean counters, as they kind of call it, you know, those who were worrying about the revenue, they were fine with this dysfunction, right? Like that was part of their profitability. And so I think you're right. It is more of an individual has a lot of compassion and care and desire to do right. But at the highest level of the organization, it is very much about the financial impact, just like my son. Like, eh, if I don't, what is, what's the damage? Like, okay, I can absorb that. That's fine. <laughs> I just think it has to be big enough. And, but I think, unfortunately, the pocketbook is one of the only ways to impact organizations. Individuals, you can impact other ways, but an organization to me is, is, is very impartial. Right. And so the only thing that we have, the quickest lever to pull is, uh, you know, is financial. Now there are other incentives too, right? That you could pull at an organization level that we haven't talked about, like penalties in terms of whether or not you get certified as an organization, yes or no. Like that would be a big blow, right? Like, uh, so you, you, but I don't, I've, I've yet to see anyone want to go that far, right? Uh, where you get decertified. Uh, those have to be some, those are some severe penalties in those areas around your, uh, around your organization. But, but I think it takes that, that degree in order to drive organizational change. Yeah. So, Let's close, John. Let me ask you this question. Is there anywhere you think penalties need to be applied that maybe aren't applied right now? So, I mean, there's a couple of perspectives and responses in my head. You know, my my libertarian view says less is more in, in most cases. So I'm not someone to go applying penalties all over. I, I think it's a dangerous thing. You know, I was even thinking through this and I'm like, okay, well, if we apply penalty to payers, 
how would that work? And what, you know, like, I, I'm not even sure how you'd structure it because obviously they're the ones that are profiting the most off of this. And unfortunately, what we've seen is no matter what you implement, penalties, regulations, restrictions, rules, whatever else, they always come out on top. So like, I feel like if you penalize the payer, you're just penalizing the patient, you know, downstream. And so th that that's a scary thing for me. You know, I, I'm interested. I think there probably is a place for some penalties for EHR vendors that aren't acting in the best interest of the patient. And, and, and that, you know, and, and, yeah, I don't think we penalize them randomly, right? I think, but I think, I think the, you know, information blocking is a good example. The access to the APIs, like I think, and I think that's usually, well, I mean, it's, it's a dual thing, right? It needs to be on the software vendor to provide it in a way that is secure and reasonable and tracked and audited and, you know, has all of those things available. And it's also on the provider to actually turn it on. I mean, Epic's complained a lot. That's why they, I think, created their 10 star system was because they created a lot of features and then their, their uh, users wouldn't even turn it on. So it's like, okay, it's great you can do, you know, my chart. It's great you can do, you know, care anywhere, everywhere. I forget the name exactly, care anywhere, care everywhere, mm -hmm. hey, whatever it's called, you know, to be able to transfer the data. But if you don't turn it on so that you can transfer the data, well, then the EHR vendor shouldn't be responsible either. So I, I think there's, there is something there for information blocking. I don't know if that's the right term for this, but, you know, encouraging them to be more open and share data, which is in the best interest of the patients, is probably a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I wish there was an easy answer for me. I mean, I, I'm, maybe it's the Canadian in me because we're used to larger government but and getting their fingers into healthcare, but... I think there needs to be some penalties around egregious uh, patient experiences. And I know there is some, there is some, you know, five-star ratings and those kinds of things. And we do have a little bit of the, you know, readmission penalty, but like if you pile up too many egregious um, uh, patient complaints, and this should be applied to payers as well as providers, right? Uh, that do, there should be some form of additional penalty beyond having to settle the lawsuit or whatever it is with that one particular individual, because those individuals have so little voice, right? Like, you know, if I've had a terrible, terrible experience with that organization, I have to go to the ombuds person, which is typically employed by that organization to try and get something done. Now, I know those people are very compassionate. They, they do their best, but I'm sure that if there was a penalty that was applied on top of whatever you had to do to fix the issue, then there would be much more motivation to not have this problem in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. To your point, I think it's just a cost of doing business. They have an ombudsperson because they know they're going to get complaints. Well, it'd be better if you didn't even have that person, right? <laughs> that you have no complaints. You don't even need that role, right? Like, I know that's that's sort of fiction, but 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 I think there need I, to me, I think there needs to be something a little bit heftier in terms of the patient experience side where I'm talking more on the, on the negative side where it's so egregious. You go, clearly this is not good. This is not what's supposed to happen. You're not supposed to wait. You're not supposed to have this happen to you. Three surgeries for the same thing. Like that's bad. And, and you know, one or two, it's okay. Those are mistakes. But if you pile up enough of them, there should be some penalties more than just the shame of the reporter reporting on it locally. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to submit someone that I had to fill out the form five times for, uh, for a bad patient experience. That, that feels like one I'd submit, but uh, let alone trying to get access to uh, MRI images and six visits and still didn't quite get them. But, uh, you know, the one that's interesting for me that I feel like there is a place for this, but I don't have any clue of how to structure it. And that's around staffing levels. Like there is something wrong there. And nurses are suffering in particular, I think, doctors as well, but nurse levels where these nurse levels are at an unsafe spot. Like, and, and but here's the problem. They're working on these penalties and, and they're looking at requiring you to have a certain percentage. And if you don't, you're going to be penalized. But it turns out when you talk to the people, you're like, wait, that penalty is going to make them just shut down that department. It's not going to actually encourage them to solve the problem of having more nurses and having a better ratio. And so I don't know how to. That's what I mean. I don't know how to structure this where, you know, 
that you're required to have a safe ratio of nurse to patients and 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 you know even by different departments that matters and you know like there's real complex things there and and I don't know if penalties is the right way to do it and maybe it's not fair either if you're a rural provider that's you know making a certain amount versus someone who has you know a couple hundred million in the bank right as some of them do let alone billions in some cases like you know like maybe they, i don't know there's a rich versus poor one too but it, it gets really complicated but i'd love to do something around staffing workforce that would be beneficial yeah no you're right i mean it'd be wonderful if we can find some motivation to fix that additional motivation to fix that problem i think massachusetts obviously tried this with the middle and staffing levels to put into law and I don't think that actually passed, but at least it brought awareness to the problem, right? And there were reasons why I think the law itself is a bit flawed. But anyway, like to your point, it'd be great to find a way to make sure that, you know, that the workforce we do have is taking is, you know, taken care of without having to unionize, right? Or or without having to resort to those kinds of tactics to get something done. Uh, that there is some sort of incentive for people to have, to have the right amount of staff there to help patients and and to help. The, the, the staff that they have, right, from burning out and from having issues. And there's some definitely some safety concerns. We're starting to hear that more and more, right, where we don't have enough staff. Not, I'm not even talking about, like, nursing staff. I'm talking about like security staff and things like that. Like So there's staffing levels that go beyond the clinical side that, you know, I'm not sure what that right ratio should be. Like, how many security staff are you supposed to have for a number of patients you see or how big your ED is or what type of patients you see? Like, there should be some sort of standard there to start, but hopefully – you know, some sort of incentive to make sure you've got the right amount of staff as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks to all of you who tuned into this episode of Healthcare IT Today. You can find out more details about our show by checking out the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And please share your voice and engage with the community at healthcareittoday.com and on social media using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hung, along with my friend and health IT collaborator, John Lin. Thanks for listening, and have a great week.